Oh. Oh. Okay, could everyone sit down, please, and we'll we'll start here. Um, Steve. Okay, very pleased to welcome Steve Bannon and Ben Ari Levy. Uh, we at the New York Times believe in open debate between uh, opposing views, and I think this is an illustration of that. Um, Steve, I'll, I'll begin with you, if I may. Um, President Trump said of the United Nations last month, the future does not belong to the globalists. The future does not belong to the globalists. Do you agree? And if so, what was your analysis of U.S. and even European society that led you to that conclusion? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that globalism is the last of the great failed ideologies of the 20th century. It's kind of predicated upon the beliefs, institutions, issues, problems of the 20th century. You know, just to go back in time briefly, 10, 12 years ago, um, September 18th, 2008, the Oval Office, uh, the Federal Reserve Chairman, Secretary of Treasury goes to see President Bush three days after Lehman Brothers goes bankrupt in London. And they tell President uh, Bush we need one trillion dollars by the end of the day, a cash infusion by the end of the day to save the American financial system and to save in the next week the global financial system. And if you don't do this, we will have global chaos and an anarchy. The, uh, re uh, the uh, balance sheet of the Federal Reserve that day was $880 billion. When Donald Trump raised his hand to become President of the United States, it was $4.5 trillion. What the global central banks did is bail out basically the oligarchs, the oligarchs that are created by globalism. And that happened by going to negative interest rates, zero interest rates. And whose shoulders was that put upon? Because that has to be paid by somebody. It was paid by working class and middle class people in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia. The deplorables, gilets jaunes, old hundred names in China. It was that effort that bailed out the elites. That is what globalism has brought us, deindustrialization, and a system of oligarchs as laid out in a book that we'll talk about later, I think one of the most important books of the 21st century, The Empire and the Five Kings, by my esteemed colleague, where he lays out the entire case of the five kings and the oligarchs. Globalism brought that upon us. The party of Davos brought that upon us. And it is, as Donald Trump said, populist nationalism that's going to see us forward. The match that was lit in the Oval Office on September 18th, 2008, exploded in the summer and fall of 2016, first in Brexit, then in the presidency of Donald Trump. And that is what we're dealing with today, and I'm sure in the rest of this debate or discussion or conversation, we'll talk more about that. But now, what do you say to that? Has globalism and globalization been bad for the world? Are you in favor of putting up walls of nationalism, of America first, of France first, and all the rest? This is big words. Let's, let's try to be uh, as concrete as possible. First of all, if you really, really read this book, you must know that one of the theses of the book is that you must be two to dance tango. If America decides to renounce globalism, and if the other side, you have Turkey, China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Sunni Islam, who continues to be globalist, then we are, we, 
not you and me, the West, the democracy is losing. Number two, let's be very concrete. This speech of Trump about globalism today, today, at this very moment, what does it mean? It means the American president, administration, retreating from Kurdistan, betraying the Kurds, not holding its words, sending to carnage our best friends, those who protected us from barbarity of ISIS, and it means for an America which I love, which I have been bred in the reverence of it, a world condemnation, a world uh, 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 non-credibility, which is a disaster. So to be against globalism, it means that. It means America as a fortress losing any sort of credibility. This is concretely what it means. The rest is words, words, words. So, Steve, is the U.S. abandoning its allies and responsibility? It, it, it absolutely is not. In fact, uh, Bernard could not be farther from the truth. Remember, in here, he calls us an empire. It's the empire versus the five kings. Bernard should know, our brothers and sisters in France should know, we're a revolutionary power, we're not an empire. That's what's happened in the devolution of this over the last 40 or 50 years. That NATO in Europe, the Gulf Emirates, the littoral nations around the South China Sea and then the Northwest Pacific, the four big hotspots in the world, became protectorates of the United States. We are not an empire. We are an ally, an ally of NATO and individual countries in NATO, an ally of the Kurds, an ally of the Gulf Emirates, the littoral nations. I don't agree with what President Trump has done in this regard, but I can understand in his and what he's trying to do is hold together the NATO alliance, which I do not believe and I am not a big believer in Turkey being a part of. I think Turkey is one of the problems, one of the five kings as so well described. America first does not mean America isolationist. In fact, in the book, In the Five Kings, what Bernard fails to do is to order who the five kings are. The party at Davos and the entire globalist system is built around slave labor in China. We have two systems, a slave system and a free system. The slave system in China, run by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party makes good for the unemployed and underemployed throughout the rest of the world. What America first means is America in a system of alliances. And how can you possibly say there and say we retreated when we have been the leader in finally confronting the CCP and decoupling this economic model from the party of Davos? And everyone in the party of Davos, all the retainers, all the hedge funds, all the law firms, the accounting firms, the marketing firms have blood on their hands with what they've allowed China to do. And so it's not America as isolationists. Do I totally agree with what happened in, in, with the Kurds? Absolutely not. But the three types of warfare, information, economic, and kinetic, all three are taking place today on the War of the Five Kings. The information ideological right here in Athens today. The economic in, in Washington, D.C., with further negotiations on the trade deal and all the other aspects of the Chinese economic war against the industrial democracies, including France, and the kinetic on the battlefields in Syria. So I don't agree with what President Trump's done, but I can understand his motivations in trying to do it. What about China, Benna? As, pre as President Trump gotten China policy right by confronting China more aggressively? I think that um, even in diplomatic relationship, you have alliances and you have friendship. Friendship means something. Friendship, which means a reliable alliance, constant in the time, well-bred, well-built. And my question today, when I look at America, 
is where is the friendly, the former friendly America to the afflicted, to the despaired, to the victims of the world. Where is the America? I read yesterday a tweet of Donald Trump. Honestly, it was like uh, a Marx Brothers or Monty Python tweet. Uh, why should Mon we help Mon the Kurds? Monty they were Python. not here in Normandy. They were not here in Normandy. But my question is, where are the inheritors of the boys who liberated Europe in Normandy? Where are the inheritors of those great guys who saved Europe from bankruptcy at the time of the Marshall Plan? Where are the inheritors of the great diplomats who led a very intelligent and wise war against communism? Where are the inheritors of America who, with the help of the Kurds, achieved to destroy ISIS? Today, what is happening at the very moment we are speaking? I just spoke with a Kurdish friend in Raqqa. The Turks, this morning, bombed a facility where you have some ISIS detainees, prisoners. What will happen? They will escape from the jail. They will disseminate all over the world. And they will come in the countries of the allies of America, if not to America itself. So for all of China, of course, it's very, it's, uh, there is an arm wrestling between China and the rest of the world. But Isn't it an ideological confrontation? It is a, an economic confrontation. It is an ideological confrontation. If you look, for example, at the use we do of that in, in America and in China, it is two worlds, two different worlds. Um, if you lose at the ways books are treated, it is also two worlds. So there is a confrontation. It has to be dealt with with strength. I don't think that the art of deal of which the president of America is so proud is a good way to, uh, ne to, to lead this confrontation. I think perhaps you agree on China, right? I think more so. But let's, let's go back to the first part. The, 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 the folks, that, the men and women that, uh, that were at Normandy and, uh, and, and really helped Europe through three crises, World War I, World War II, and the Cold War, which you so brilliantly say is all one global conflict of the 20th century. They're there today. They're on the ships in the South China Sea. It's, it's the young men and women patrolling in the Hindu Kush. It's the people at the, uh, at the parallel, at the DMZ in North Korea. They're still there. America is still there. What we're trying to do and what Trump is trying to do is say only in an alliance of the West with, with our other partners and other allies like India and Japan, the littoral nations around the South China Sea, only the, the, that... The only Japanese today are shivering of fear of what can happen to them after the diplomatic show of your president with Kim Jong-un. <laughs> they know that they are in the front line and they are not reassured at all. We, we are the, that's actually not totally true. No president, at least partly. No, no, no president, no president of the United States has ever engaged in the Northwest Pacific like President Trump. I was on a destroyer back in the 70s and 80s in the Northwest Pacific, the South China Sea, the Persian Gulf, the North Arabian Sea. America was never engaged as it is today. Look, the, the, the situation in North Korea, in Afghanistan, in Venezuela, Donald Trump didn't create these. The great geniuses of globalization created that, right? The Cuban Missile Crisis in North Korea, the uh, Vietnam War in Afghanistan, the Bay of Pigs in, uh, in Venezuela, all that was created by the geniuses of both political parties and the party of Davos, the EU, the United Nations, all of it was created. Donald Trump is engaged more, and if you talk to the Japanese, as now they start to rearm, they will tell you the problem's not North Korea. North Korea is a vassal state of China. And this is not about the Chinese people. The Chinese people are the most decent, hardworking people on earth. Look in Hong Kong. 
where your democracy forum is playing out in real time on a battlefield between totalitarianism and democracy, English common law and the Chinese work ethic has created Hong Kong, and those kids are prepared to fight and die for that. Donald Trump has done more in getting the, the, not just the U.S. government from being a collaborator to the rise of the Chinese Communist Party and its totalitarian mercantilist system, but to actually engage it and start to deconstruct it. His deal, the deal that was supposed to be signed in May, deconstructs the entire Chinese economy and merges it into a world economy. This is what he's fighting for. That's the leadership. If we don't win that battle, that's about the five kings. The, the oligarchs are tributary states to China. China has a network effect. That's why they're trying to break the Westphalian system, the nation state. The organization, the organizing entity, like in France, that gives people the most freedom and the most control of their own destiny. That's what's at stake here, and that's why globalization is a failed, another failed ideology of the 20th century. If, if and, and populist nationalism is our way forward. But if I may, Steve, you posit nationalism as the answer to failed globalization. Concretely, let's take France. You go to the Front National, now renamed, in France, and you say, wear xenophobia as your badge, wear nationalism as your badge, be proud of it, uh, you're winning. Why do you come out like that and support a xenophobic party? Hang on for a second. Hang on for a second. I said that in looking at the policies of Donald Trump, who they called a xenophobe, a nativist, Islamophobe, a racist. I said, look at his policies in reaching out to the Arab world in our first summit at Riyadh, in, in, in the policies, economic policies that caused the lowest unemployment. I said, when the policies and his actions they won't look at the facts, the accusation of xenophobe, the accusation of racist, the accusation of Islamophobe, wear that as a badge of honor because you're winning. They can't debate you on the facts. And that are, that is the facts. In Front National and the Gilets Jean, what they're looking for is to get their country back and to stand with the united and proud France. That's not wrong. That is right and that is the way forward. How did the Gilets Jean even start? Macron, who was supposed to be a reformer, what did he do? He put the entire burden, the entire burden of the Paris Accord, which is China cheating on global warming, he put the entire uh, solution for that on the back of the people in France who could pay for it less. And that's why they revolted. No, no, um, Gilets Jaunes was a, was a much more complicated story. But... Uh, one of the numerous differences between Steve Bannon and me, you are speaking of Gilets Jaunes, one of the big differences, there are many others, is that um, when there is a disaster in America, where there is a storm, where there, where there is a, a big riot, I am with the American people, honestly, with all my genuity, and my friendship and my loyalty. When Paris burns, you said, that's great. Paris burning, this is great. You were with Marine Le Pen in the gathering of Front National and you were happy with that. Me, when New York burns, God does that it does not happen, I would be very sad. This is number one. Number two, populism and nationalism. For me, the real stake of today, and this is why I think you do a very dirty job in Europe, is that all these movements which you are trying to help, they are not so happy with it, by the way, as you know, but all these movements, they are weakening Europe. They are working against Europe's values and Europe's interest. They are playing for Erdogan, for Xi Jinping, and for Putin. They are receiving money from these countries. They are receiving advisors, from them, and they are making alliances. Marine Le Pen, this is a very striking thing for me. Each time, my country has been at war, real war or diplomatic war. It's a very important moment in the story of a country, 
your friend Marine Le Pen systematically took part for the enemy, for Gaddafi during the Libyan war, for Bashar al-Assad during the Syrian war, for uh, in all circumstances, for Putin in the time of sanctions, and so on. So there is a problem in internal uh, in international policy, but also in domestic policy, which is very simple, loyalty. All these people, they are not loyal to their fatherland. As I believe, by the way, that you are you when you are in charge. And you in Breba is, are not loyal to, to your own country and its greatness. I read sometimes Breitbart, your website, and when I see, I, I saw in a BuzzFeed, I, I think, such a disgusting video uh, of uh, Mr. Milo Yanopoulos uh, singing um, a song in praise of America. And then the camera turns, and you see Mr. Spencer of the Ku Klux Klan and others making Nazi salute. The Nazi salute, the Nazi, uh, uh, right. uh, le, le salut Nazi. This way, making the Nazi, making the Nazi salute in the country which pays such a price of blood for the destroying of Nazism. This is a very ugly and a very dirty act of loyalty. Steve. I'm sorry to say it so abruptly, but it's really what I think. No, you, no you're, not, you're not sorry. You don't have to apologize. Never apologize. Never apologize. No, I'm sorry. Never apologize. No, it's so no, sad. No, no. It's so sad. So sad. I know it's so sad. Um, don't, 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 don't throw we, it out there. We, we don't throw it out there. You can don't, see it. Don't throw it out. No, 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 no. <laughs> don't throw it out there and then apologize. Right? The reason you do that, he can't debate the facts. Right. So once again, there, this is what this is what this is what the global elites always do. They can't debate the facts. Let's go back to the Gilet Jean. You were I, were you not in the streets in 1968 protesting? Wasn't that, wasn't that one of your proudest moments in the 68 protest? It was very different. In 68, you had a sense of brotherhood. You had a sense of hope. You had between women and men a sense of fraternity. You had for, the will, for, for, wait a minute, no, no, of more freedom and more equality. The yellow jacket, they, of course they had a lot of distress, but you did not have this feeling. And when they expressed politically, they asked for a general to direct the country, or they asked for Jean-Luc Mélenchon or for Marine Le Pen to take office. It was the opposite of May 68. Steve? No, no. What, what the Gilets Jean in that specific uh, remark was made in Brussels at a, at a, uh, a meeting of many uh, center-right and right-wing parties. Of what you said, that Saturday, when the Gilets Jean protests started to spread to Brussels, that Paris is burning. I didn't celebrate that. I stated a fact. Paris is burning. And why is Paris burning? Because your buddy Macron and the rest of the global elites tried to once again pay for globalization by putting it on working class people. And they were revolting. And in that first week of December, it could have gone either way. That could have spread. Right? If, if Marine Le Pen and other leaders had come in there, that protest, that violent protest could have spread throughout France. It did not. And I think that showed tremendous restraint by many of what you call the right-wing leaders in, uh, in Europe, okay? And, and so, and I'm 100% supporter of the Gilets Jaunes. I think what they did and how they did it and why they did it is 100% justified. And it sent a shockwave to the French elite and they cratered. Macron cratered that weekend and started to give back, started to take off the taxes. He blinked, okay? So, so, so don't sit there and say it's not effective and don't sit there and let's, let's go to the to the racism charge. First off, the Milo uh, videotape was y y way after I left Breitbart. I was at the White House and then gone. This was something he did. He had already been fired at Breitbart when that was made. If you go back, Breitbart's been the leader of the fight against BDS in the United States. It's been the strongest supporter of Israel. It's been a, it's been a fighter against white nationalism and white supremacy from day one. About, about, then, uh, then bring, uh, please bring up, please bring up, 
please bring up and send me one article. If there had been, BuzzFeed would have had all these articles time and time again. What it did was it promoted populism. It promoted economic nationalism. And it was the backbone of the deplorables and the Trump revolt and the Trump victory, of which I'm very proud. About uh, Paris burning, uh, I hope the New York Times fact checker will check exactly what you said and in which circumstance. About Milo, uh, you were not in charge, but I hope the New York Times fact checker will find all the articles which were published during your uh, running the office, where, for example, you, uh, some of your collaborators compared the abortion to the Shoah, to the Holocaust, or said that uh, abortion made the women ugly and big. These sort of articles were published Which, under, the, let me finish, under your leadership. But why don't you read them? Why don't, have you read them? If you're going to bring them I, up... Of course have I you, read. You know, then you know the one about the birth control is a parody I, I where know, they're making I fun of it. The and by the way, the people in the, anti, in the in, anti-abortion mo- uh, movement do compare it to a Holocaust. They do compare, what, the 100 million people... Have been, I know, the, but this comparison is, is an outrage, is a profanation to the victim of Holocaust. A decent journalist or a decent uh, uh, head of a network should ask this comparison not to be said. We ha- should rec- not censor, Bernard, but Bernard, should Bernard, recommend. Our, our senior These editors. are undecent. It is an insult to the victim of the Holocaust. Bernard, our three senior editors happen to be Jewish who approved those articles, okay? okay. They the, happen to the, be Jewish. The problem, they're fine with them. They're fine. They're, they were absolutely all fine the anti-Semites them. have a Jewish friends. This is a law. This is a law. The problem is that when you compare abortion to an Holocaust, it is an insult to the women first, to the living women, and to the dead Jews. And it is a double fault and crime and for the values of America if, it if, is a suicide if you, if you, more if, than a crime if you, if more you, than a fault if you look, a suicide for America Bernard, and what you, is happening today with Trump is I'm sorry a suicide for America this is what is Bernard, Bernard, I Bernard, think Bernard, I think Bernard. Steve has, no, hey, has a right to reply no, here no 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 I love this he's using my tactic just talk over him um, I love it it's, it's very good not it's not a very, tactic it's very good I'm not a it's tactician very good. Um, First off, that, that you, as you know, and I am accused by the far right all the time of being a Zionist. I am a Christian Zionist, but being too pro-Israel, too pro-Jewish because of our anti-BDS. It's not that we have Jewish friends at Breitbart. Andrew Breitbart was Jewish. The site was principally had Jewish editors, okay? And people went through this, and, and many people who we have a Breitbart Israel site that approved this. So we're not ashamed of that article. We're not ashamed of the, of the concept of it. And we don't think it casts aspersions on the Holocaust, and we certainly don't think it casts aspersions on the women. What we're talking about, and the same thing they're talking about in China today, about the, the, what they've had with the abortions there. And so we're very proud of it. Let's go to the Trump situation. Trump is rejuvenating, and he's an imperfect instrument, okay? He'd be the first to admit that. He's rejuvenating the United States economically, and he's rejuvenating it for working class Hispanics and blacks. That's why his approval rating uh, among Hispanics right now, I think, is close to 40%. With uh, Hispanic males, it's over 50%. This is because his economic policies are working, and we're rejuvenating. We're built, rebuilding our military. We're having stronger alliances now in NATO because we finally forced NATO. Bernard, when we came on, it was the Secretary General of NATO that said this alliance is in shambles. The individual countries are not paying enough. The 2% you weren't even come close enough to, to make. Donald Trump did that. We put extra money into exercises and equipment and interoperability. All the things you have to have to have an alliance work. Not some general happy talk, but the nuts and bolts, the specificity that you want to make things Steve work. Bannon, That's why Trump you, is rejuvenating. You, you do great efforts to please your president. I appreciate that. You do great efforts. And I must say, I... I had pity of you once, a lot of times. Most of the time, I, I opposed you. I, I feel really your adversary. One time, I had pity for you. It is when you were fired from the White House. And when Donald Trump, in his disgusting way, made a tweet saying that you cried and that you begged for your job. 
So maybe today you are going to have your job back with this good work you are doing. But let's speak seriously. No, no, hang on. No, 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 You're such a big nose and fact checker. You'll go to the New York Times and you will see that Maggie Haberman reported, I resigned on August 7th to the president. Not fired, resigned. And okay. report, hold it, report in the, the New York Times. Donald Trump. The tweet was six months it later. It was so cruel. I did not like this tweet. I said to you that this day I was, I was again, if I was see shocked the tweet, by this cruelty. Once again, Bernard, you, you want to have your own facts, okay, which you can't do. Which you're, I, you're saw, great. I saw the tweet yesterday. The tweet, when, the tweet when I left the White House, <laughs> he said, what a great job I did, how fantastic. It was six months later, Bernard, if you check yeah, yeah, your yeah, facts, yeah. it was in December of the following year yeah, yeah. that after it was quoted in a book saying certain after comments. After Michael Wolf and so on. That's know. when he came back and said that. And by the way, what Donald Trump says in tweets doesn't affect me. Okay. okay, I know Donald Trump, and okay. I understand his it, tweets. It affected me. I was so I was sorry for you. But about alliances, you don't have, hold it, hold it, uh, hold it. No, 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 no. NATO, you don't have to be sorry. NATO what you should has be, never what been you so weak Bernard. as it is today. America has never been so indifferent at what the hell can happen to Europe. You have to speak when, in when fact. Advisors you have to speak Trump in fact. In Pentagon, Bernard, when, wait a minute. No, no, this is an important yeah. point for all of us. We yeah. are speaking under the, ban the banner of Athen Democracy Forum. Donald Trump has today some military advisors and some diplomats who tell him that he takes the risk to have a rush of jihadists in Europe. And he does not give a shit about it. The jihadists of Kurdistan coming back, disseminating. Is this a good way to treat the ally? Is this a way to reinforce the alliance of NATO? Steve, this what is do you a say? joke. This is once again total. You're supposed to be a sophisticated and learned audience. We ought to start. You have to start with facts. You want to get granular, let's get granular. When, we, when Donald Trump took over, NATO had never been weaker. It's the NATO general secretary that says that. The spending on equipment, on training, on interoperability of an alliance was not there. That's what Donald Trump pressed NATO. It was the NATO general secretary that said six months, the alliance is stronger than it's been in decades because of the increased spending of the European national countries and more interoperability and quite frankly in our one trillion dollar defense bill which it really is not 800 billion dollars really a trillion we are putting more money into into North Atlantic into North we are that's just that, that, these, these, are and, and these are facts and alliance and alliance is not only a question of money it's a question of reliability it is a question of ideas it's a question of values this is what an alliance is about and today when Donald Trump takes the risk of being mocked by Erdogan, when he takes the risk to say to Vladimir Putin that he deserves a triple A, when he takes the risk of making to the Iranians, who are supposed to be our enemies, such a gift as the Kurdistan of Iraq, this is the real betrayal of the spirit of alliance. The, the French poet, uh, that died, the Catholic socialist but poet. I appreciate the publicity. No, no, yes, no. Yes, sure. yes, this, yes. no. I appreciate. This is one of the few most important <laughs> books of the 21st century. I've read this well, thing there you go. actually three times. I intend to read it many more times. Read, I, it, read it a fourth one. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> read, read it, it with your one. notes. No, because here's the, you get it two-thirds right and one-third horribly wrong. The French poet what is, that died in the trenches of World War I, PG, the, the Catholic Socialist, said, we have a duty to report what we see, but we have a higher duty to see what we see. That is your problem, sir. You are third eye blind. You do not see, even with this book, what's sitting right in front of you. It is not five kings. It is China and tributary states against the West. And if we don't, in our wisdom, over time, pull off into our alliance Russia and reunite Russia with the Judeo-Christian West, we are not going to win this war. The key is the Gulf states and Russia. It is going to be China, 
Persia, and Turkey to control the Eurasian landmass. You lay it out very succinctly in your book, but you don't prioritize. Russia is not our eternal enemy. Russia is run by bad guys. It's a kleptocracy, and they have a lot of weapons, and they cause mischief and harm in places like Syria. But fundamentally, we can, by wisdom and understanding, start to reunite. So no, Russia is not our mortal enemy. Steve, the Judeo-Christian West. What about all the other people who live in the West? Well, no. The, the, look, that's the great thing about the Judeo-Christian West. The Judeo-Christian West has always been very open. It's been always been very open. How do you think Steve, we have Steve, such no, a vibrant... No, not, all, not always open Steve, to the Jews. Steve, Steve Bannon, let's be, let's be serious one minute. And to be serious means listening what the crucial people say. Putin says it openly and more and more openly. He is the adversary of Europe as it is. He has a strategic project, which is the Eurasian project, which is methodically opposed to the European project. He wants to destroy Europe. That's why he pays the extreme rightist, or he tries to pay or to finance the extreme rightist parties. That's why he multiplicates all these provocations to Europe a violation of the airspace of uh, uh, Baltic states or Poland and so on. He is you, the enemy of Europe. You have to open eyes. This is the reality of he, today. He, and when Donald has, Trump, when your president, which you are so eager to please today, says that this Putin deserves a triple A, what can I tell you? We pro American friends in Europe are despaired of this new face of America. America is more committed to a Europe of nations than it's ever been. The, 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 Europe the, of the, nations. But hang on, but many people in the United States, in supporting people like the Le Pen movement and like Salvini and Nigel Farage and Brexit, are not supporters of what the EU has become in Brussels and certainly not supporters of the party of Davos that have allowed these oligarchs to, 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 to increase. This is the party of Davos is, is, is the party of Davos are the global elites that drive the globalist system that kowtow to China, that have a system now that's half slave and half free, that have destroyed the working class in Great Britain, in the United States, in France. That is what we're opposed to, and we're going to stay opposed to that. And, and, and guess what? We're winning, and we're going to win. And that Europe of nations is going to be stronger than ever. Not, not a weak NATO, and not some centralized bureaucracy in Brussels that tells people what to do, but individual nations governed by their own people in a democracy as handed down from Jerusalem and Athens and Rome that can govern themselves. And this is what free men and women or this is what the Westphalian system is, and that's what we support. You support the breaking of that system and to become a United States of Europe. What the Europeans want, what the working class people in Europe that support these parties, what they want is a Europe of individual nations. Steve, um, Steve, once at the impeachment inquiry, where's that headed? I think the impeachment inquiry is a mortal threat to Donald Trump's presidency, but in a broader... <laughs> the, but, you know, in the democracy forum, I don't know why you're clapping. You should be opposed to this. This is the nullification project that started from the very moment we had to come from behind win. Remember, we won because in the upper Midwest states, working class Democrats, low propensity Democrats, and people from high combat casualty counties and districts voted for Trump. That's why we won. And the popular vote, ma'am, is not how we uh, elect presidents of the United States. If it was, ma'am, if it was, ma'am, we would have won the popular vote. But thank you. Um, the, 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 so showing democracy, showing democracy strong, the left organized. And in 2018, I think they did a fantastic job. And I kept saying, hey, if they win the House of Representatives, they will immediately start to impeach Donald Trump. And they won. If you, if you gross up the, the 2018 election, they beat us 52 to 46 by over 8 million votes. 
That is, to me, a very cause of concern in 2020, and that's why I think Trump has to get back to basics to accomplishing things like building the wall, like starting to wind down these foreign wars in Syria and in Afghanistan without abandoning the Kurds like it looks like we have. So I'm a big supporter of that, but I think that this, this impeachment is a moral threat to his presidency, not just to his ability to actually remain as president, but his ability to govern as a populist, because I think even in this trial in the Senate, because I think there's no doubt Nancy Pelosi will bring two charges of, uh, of impeachment against him. And so there'll be a trial in the Senate that he has to worry about what type of compromises he'll have to make. So this is very serious, but it shows you anti-democratic forces at work. Whether you want to accept it or not, you're lost, okay? That's just the way it is. But immediately, the, the, the media, the opposition party media, which is far stronger than the Democratic Party, okay, with the big donors, went to work to remove Donald Trump and to nullify a presidential election. That's what this impeachment is about. What did the Republicans do when President Obama was at the White House? Well, the, oh, anyway. I no, mean, no, 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 no. We, we, we were in opposition. I think we were a loyal opposition. We would try to be a tough opposition. Try to block it. Well, let, let me uh, let me reply. Uh, would, you am, like see, would you like to see? Would you like to see President Trump the impeached? Thread. I will lose the thread. Would you like to see President Trump impeached? Let, viewed from France. My dear Roger, I would I would not say that I am happy if America was burning, and I I. I need to say that I would not, I would be very uncomfortable if the president of America was impeached. I, this would be for the American institutions, for the American democracy, this would not be a good news. But let me reply. The party of Davos, I don't know really what it is. You always speak of party of Davos. What does that mean except big conspiracy theories? What I know is, for example, you spoke about Farage. Farage in England, what is he doing? He's dismantling Great Britain. Because of Farage and his affiliates, Great Britain is going to become again little England. With the withdrawal of Scotland, with the crisis between the two islands, and so on. Marine Le Pen, Salvini, what are they doing? They are spitting at democracy, because democracy, you should know, is more complicated than they, your friends, or yourself seem to think. It is not only the will of the people. Of course it's the will of the people, but not only. If the will of the people consists in voting for Hitler or supporting Mussolini, it is not democracy. So democracy is a lot of other principles adding themselves to the will of the people, right of the minorities, right of law, uh, 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 freedom of speech, a lot of it. It's a civilization democracy. And all the people you, you mentioned and that you celebrate now that you are back more or less uh, to office in Breitbart, uh, have a hand it, of it at least, they are spitting at the face of this great idea which is democracy. And as for America, that's why of course, I would be happy uh, if Donald Trump was insulted, but was impeached. But my embarrassment comes... You, you just said you would not be. No, I would be happy. Change your mind? No, I would be happy. Just an alternative I'm fact. Embarrassment. But my, no, no, but I am embarrassed to see that America has become, all over the world, a piece of love has become a giant which words don't mean anything. I was on the ground, on the battlefield in, Kur in Iraqi Kurdistan when the Kurds made a referendum and where they went abandoned by America. Abandoned to who? Abandoned to Iran. And this was such a an incredible news, all of a sudden, like a thunderstorm, the world of America, the world, the speaking of America, was meaningless. Its value was zero. So I'm sad of that. This is my main concern. And in the general picture, 
England losing its moral leadership, Europe losing its sense of democracy, and America giving place to the five kings. And I add one more last point. You said uh, that you are in favor of Europe of singular nations. But in this world which you pretend to know, when you have in front of you a Turkey which, which goes back to the Ottoman dream of empire, when you have in front of you a Putin who has a dream and a will of empire, when you have in front of you huge China, when you have in front of you Iran, which is back to the Persian imperial dream, how can you resist <laughs> like little village you resist, or like little but, cities of Greece one resist, by one you, and one knows you re, you in the ancient history you resist, that it, you this resist. is the real tipping point when the great civilization no, no. fails? Not, no, not through, not through an anti-democratic operation like the EU. You, you succeed the same way you succeeded in World War I and World War II by a united group of nations, nation states. Europe will be stronger as a Europe of nations, not a United States of Europe, a, un a Europe of nations. Every one of these leaders in these nations want stronger, more robust. They want more robust sovereignty, they want a more robust economy, but they want better jobs and higher paying jobs Did for their people. you see how Salvini insulted Macron a few months ago? You think that is, this is a good way to unite and to confront the challenge of the future? I, I think, by the way, different nations, uh, by, uh, 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 different leaders having differences and arguing them out, I don't have a problem with. The Italians have a certain way they see things, just like the French have a certain way. No, I don't have a problem with that. That's the, way, that's the way nations are. The, the, Europe of nations is going to be our strongest uh, part of this alliance that we're going to need of the industrial democracies to defeat the five kings. And it shouldn't be lost on you that it was the European Brussels that wanted Turkey as a NATO partner. The problem we have with Turkey, it's in a NATO alliance. Why was that? That was partially driven by people in Brussels. You said a conspiracy. I have been the anti-conspiracy guy. I've said from day one, there's no deep state. We're not Egypt or we're not, we're not uh, Turkey. There's no deep state. And the party of Davos is not a conspiracy. It's in your face. The third week of January of 2017, there were two speeches given. One on Wednesday in Davos by Xi, of which all the Davos, all the lawyers, all the accounting firms, all the marketing firms, the hedge funds, the banks, the investment banks, Cal toed to him when he gave a speech that we're the forefront of globalism and this barbarian Trump, this populist rising populism is a problem. Everyone in that audience that gave him a standing ovation knew about the Uyghurs, they knew about the Tibetan Buddhists and the Dalai Lama, they knew about the house Christians, they knew about the organ harvesting. These are the smartest people in the world. This is not a conspiracy, it is in plain sight. It is the party at Davos, those incompetent and corrupt elites that have given us a world of oligarchs. Oligarchs built on the back of working class people in the industrial democracies and old hundred names in China. That is what this war is, about to, is going to be about. In this war today, the ideological pieces in Athens today, the battlefield and the kinetic pieces in Syria, and the economic war is in is in uh, Washington, D.C. Don't think this has not started. It has started. And how we're going to win is defeat the Chinese Communist Party and destroy this network of the five kings. And part of that is to bring Russia over in alliance with ourselves. I have to bring this to uh, a close. Uh, just quickly, Ben, uh, um, you know, why do you think this kind of debate is so rare? It's not very often in our democracies these days that you see Two smart people of differing views argue it out, um, mano a mano. Why doesn't it happen? Because it's, uh, we're all in our ideological because silos. Because it's probably difficult to speak anthropophagy with a cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the reason why it is so rare. And honestly, it is the first time. Let's avoid I, the I ad hominem. Wait, no, 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 it's true. I hesitated because I know Steve Bannon. I know the role you try to play. I know your literature. I know, I know in my country, in France, 
your two references, and I know well the culture of my country, are Charles Maurras and Jean Raspail, the two writers you like, at least. But the, it is the worst of our culture. Charles Maurras is the builder, the inventor of French anti-Semitism. And Jean Raspail is the real inventor of this crazy theory of grand remplacement, which is putting the fire in the, which is trying to put the fire in the brains of the European people. So it's true that it is hard to discuss with somebody with whom you disagree on everything. There is not one point of what we, you said which I don't uh, disagree uh, uh, with. So uh, that's, that's probably the, the reason. And why did it happen? Because of you, Roger Cohen, and because of the liberalism of the New York Times and of Achille, who has this uh, Talon d'Achille wounded today, maybe because of us, I don't know. Thank yeah, you, Steve, Steve, why doesn't it happen? And then we have to close. I, I think one reason is that the public intellectuals on the, for the globalists are, are, have better think tanks, more well-funded. There's not, I don't think on our side, a tremendous amount of public intellectuals. I'm not a public intellectual. I'm a street fighter, okay? I, th th this is one of the great intellectuals in, in the world today. And certainly, I think the leader and the smartest of all the intellectuals, public intellectuals, about globalization. I, don't, I think we have very smart people. I don't think we have people on that level that can argue with you. Certainly not me. I'm a street fighter. I'm a, I'm a practitioner, okay? A carnivore, as you would say. Um, but no, that's what I think. But I think that these, ha these forums and these debates have to go, number one, just as a relief valve, this populist nationalist movement's not going away. And it does believe in democracy. It does believe in democracy because you guys only started having, having concerns about democracy when you started losing elections, right? There was no problem during the Obama years. There's no crisis the, in democracy. Brexit and Donald Trump and Salvini and Le Pen and, and Nigel Farage, all of a sudden it's a global problem in democracy because you're losing. No, of course. The, the real situation of today is that you have uh, some leaders who use democracy in order to torpedo democracy. This is the situation of today. That is true. That is true of Trump and not only democratic means. As you know, Trump won the election also by undemocratic means. Don't forget Cambridge un, Analytica. Un, un, Don't un, forget un, the little Putin un, push un, of, un, uh, of un, unbelievable. Don't forget it, all the pressures from that. So, this is the situation we have to confront. But what I can tell you, what, let me finish. As I long, will, let no, me on. finish, please. Have the courtesy of let me finish. You're supposed to be let about me, facts, sir. Uh, you're, you're supposed to be about facts. Okay, let, okay even, really, even, last even, word. Even, we have to even, conclude oh, it. Even, even in the, uh, Kepler, or the, in his book, said it was 100,000 Facebook ads. Okay, it was nothing. The reason you lost is Hillary Clinton did not go and make her case to working class Democrats in Michigan and Wisconsin. Your fable, you still had it stolen from you. You lost and you were beaten. Part of democracy is accepting when you get your ass kicked, okay? Okay, we on that note, we will end. Enough learn. to let me finish my, my sentence. All right. Will you be polite enough to let me finish the sentence we interrupted? Okay? I just want to say that you are right. At this moment, the populists are on the rise. On the rise. They are putting some points, but I believe that they will lose. And that democracy, at the end, not so long, will prevail. Look at what happened at the European elections. You were bragging. You were hoping to make an international of the populist parties. And you announced, you predicted a sort of a, a, a storm of victory. It was not the case. And Marine Le Pen in my country did not arrive in the position she hoped. So, wait a minute. And as we say in French, rira bien qui rira le dernier. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Stuart. That's it. Thank you both very much.